Environment and Rural Affairs, and I call Linda Dillon. can call you question number one. With your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, I take question 1 and 13 together. My department has made every effort to prepare traders and haulage businesses to implement the new processes required to move goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. During November and December, the department held a series of trader information seminars, during which presentations were made to a large range of stakeholders. The processes were explained, and participants were able to put specific questions to an expert panel. We are in the early weeks of working with the new arrangements brought about by the EU exit. There is a period of adjustment as everyone adapts. The regulatory checks under the protocol are particularly pronounced for agri-food. These are long-term problems and not easily solved. Many are proving intractable issues. However, we will continue to mitigate against those and call upon the EU to show pragmatism for Northern Ireland. My officials are working with industry, logistics companies and hauliers to achieve compliance. I have also raised these matters with the United Kingdom Government and the Commission Vice President to highlight the current difficulties and press for better solutions. I am clear that while we work towards solutions, the protocol is the main cause of the disruption within the internal market. As a result of the protocol, UKG and the European Union have ensured additional costs to businesses, Northern Ireland consumers, and impacted market chains, reducing choice and limiting supply for GB, from GB businesses, we also need to work to mitigate against cliff edges at the end of the grace periods in the next three to six months. I call Linda Dillon for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. I suppose just for clarity, I think Brexit is the main cause of the, of the problems that we're having, if we're going to be honest about it. Just in relation to then the conclusion of the trade and cooperation agreement obviously came at a, at a very late stage in the day. And the Minister will be aware of the concerns raised by the Chief Vet, Robert Hui, about the lack of preparedness. Have you had any engagements, Minister, with HMRC to provide better support for businesses, including, for example, a dedicated telephone helpline? Um, our department officials have worked very hard um, with everyone uh, to deal with the issues that have risen um, on the internal market as a consequence of the protocol, uh, which was supported by um, Sinn Féin. SDLP, Alliance and Green Party, who called for its rigorous implementation. Uh, what we are seeing at the moment is light touch implementation, and the problems that we are facing are as a consequence of light touch in implementation. Once we get the rigorous implementation that uh, the parties uh, have requested, we will be in a considerably worse position. DARE hosted a post of end of transition webinar on the 7th of January. And the event was targeted at businesses in GB and Northern Ireland aimed to help implement the new arrangements. DEFRA colleagues and representatives from HMRC participated in the event and extended the communication reach to GB businesses via their engagement channels. Members of the Trade and Agriculture Committee will also alert their counterpart representative organisations in GB of the opportunity to dial into these events. And work is ongoing with DEFRA colleagues to develop complementary messaging around key issues and develop a structured approach to assisting businesses to adapt to ongoing changes following the end of the grace period. I call Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. The unmitigated disaster that is the Northern Ireland Protocol, propagated and delivered by the Alliance Party, Sinn Féin and the SDLP, that placed political ideology above the citizens of Northern Ireland is causing an appalling state of affairs for many people across our country. What mitigating efforts, Minister, is being taken in engaging with Her Majesty's Government? And does that include the invocation of Article 16 to free us from the shackles that the European Union and those within this House have placed us under? Well, I thank the member um, for the question. Um, with regards to that, there is considerable um, discussions that are taking place at the highest level of government on a regular basis. Um, so Michael Gove, George Eustace, Brant Lewis, um, the, the various cabinets, appropriate cabinet secretaries, um, are meeting with um, both ministers and indeed members of parliament um, a, 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 on a regular basis that they're hearing uh, about the issues. And you know the issues are significant, and we need to recognise the issues are significant. Uh, but the three-month and six-month cliff edges are where the issues become really more problematic. And that does impact upon our hospitality sector. It will lead, unless there are changes made, 
to disruptions to supply to schools, hospitals, and also prisons. And I will reiterate that because some people were particularly disingenuous in the last week whenever I did raise it. That is what the minute of the meeting describes, not my minute, the official minute of the meeting. So BBC and other media outlets and indeed other politicians may seek to undermine what I said and try to create some discrepancy in terms of the veracity of it. The minute is there. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answers. Just uh, a short reminder is that no Brexit, there would have been no protocol. Simple as that. Um, but anyway, to get back to the here and now, uh, where we are, in regard to trade support services, um, Minister, have, has your department, and I have to say your officials, have been very helpful uh, to businesses. However, uh, the, that cannot be said about trade support services. Uh, where there seems to be varying degrees of experience there. Um, can you advise what uh, liaison there has been between DERA and Trade Support Services to establish maybe a more experienced wealth of information at that support service? DERA, has, as a department, has been working extremely hard with everybody else that, that they can in terms of um, indicating to people what is coming down the line. Um, in terms of the implementation of the protocol and uh, what uh, the, the legal ramifications of it are. And consequently, um, I do not think there was a, uh, the same level of preparation had taken place on the Great Britain side as has taken place on the Northern Ireland side. But leaving that to the one side, even with all of the preparation that had taken place on the Northern Ireland side, there would have still been considerable problems as a consequence of the protocol of its implementation um, in such a quick fashion. Uh, so we do need uh, a period of time uh, to work this through. Uh, EU officials need to recognise that um, forcing this on at a faster pace is something which is going to cause massive problems for Northern Ireland. And we need to be able to respond to this in a, in a sensible way. Um, my personal preference would be that um, substantial elements of this protocol um, are reviewed, um, up to and including the invoking of Article 16, uh, because at this moment in time it is causing hardship um, to the community and has the potential to cause far greater hardship if it goes as planned. I call Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister? What additional information uh, or administration is required for goods moving onwards to the Republic of Ireland or other parts of the EU compared to those remaining within Northern Ireland? Well, well it's all, all of the goods that are coming to Northern Ireland that require SPS require SPS. Um, so th th those, those goods that have had the appropriate SPS checks um, should, in theory, be able to remove to the Republic of Ireland um, without issue because they have entered um, the single market at that point, uh, uh, and that should not be an issue. Having said that, um, the, Europe, the Irish government seem to have created a problem of their own in that the fishermen or the, uh, the, 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 that are landing fish can only land in a small number of ports in Ireland. The remarkable thing is that they could bring the, the, the fish which they are catching uh, on the north and west coast of Ireland um, back to Lissahalley port, put it onto a lorry and drive it to exactly the same port uh, in the Republic of Ireland. So we need a bit of common sense to be applied um, on the Republic of Ireland side of things as well. I call Jim Oster. Well, the Minister is absolutely right to call out the pan-nationalist front for their demands for the rigorous implementation of the protocol. Does he too not, though, have a credibility problem? Because he is the minister who told this House on a number of occasions that he had no intention of facilitating infrastructure at the border. And yet he is the minister with his department who has built the infrastructure for the Irish sea border. Having built the border, what does he now intend to do to get rid of it? Well, I know that uh, the member always likes to get one up on, on uh, his unionist colleagues, um, and he has been attempting to, to 
pin this one on me for a very long time, uh, unsuccessfully thus far, except with the exception of a small number of people. Um, but uh, he knows real well um, that this is an element of the protocol. He knows real well that the UK government um, have demanded it and are paying for it in its entirety. Uh, and he knows real well that I have given no instruction uh, whatsoever to any official to build anything. Um, uh, 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 at the ports um, on land, which actually doesn't belong to my department in any event. And I have the, 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 the legal advice here, and, and the member is at Queen's Council, so he knows, he knows a bit about the law. He knows more about the law than any of us, and he knows how inappropriate it is for him to ask a, a minister uh, to actually break the law in the, in the course of the job that he's actually carrying out. Moving on, I call Mike Nesbitt. Question two. The analysis of the outcome of the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement by the Northern Ireland Fishermen's Federation, in particular that part that deals with the fisheries agreement, reflects understandable disappointment by the industry that more was not achieved. However, as the analysis points out, Northern Ireland fishermen will still have a greater share of Irish sea fish stocks than they had previously. These gains are not of the magnitude that they had hoped, but they are gains nonetheless. They will save the industry financially, as they will not have to engage in expensive quota swaps to obtain this additional quota. So by 2025, we will have almost all the Irish sea herring quota, and from 2021, the much-hated Hague preference that led to annual reductions in our shares of cod, whiting, place and sole has gone. Overall, my assessment is that increased shares for Area 7 nephrops and Irish sea stocks will give security to the Northern Ireland fishing fleet. This will allow it to fish to its current levels, but without the added cost of securing additional quota to meet its needs. The outcome for the main RIC stocks are as, as follows. Area 7 nephrop shares will go up from 33% to 42% by 2025. The RIC herring share will increase from 74 to 99% by 2025. RIC cod previously at 29% will rise to 45% by 2025 and whiting from 39 to 61 per cent by 2025. RIC haddock share will increase from 48 to 56 per cent. Call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, I thank the Minister. The, the Fishermen's Federation briefing paper is three pages long. I think it will be summarised by this one line, which I quote, the fishing industry had been led to believe it would be much better off. We are not. But looking forward, they are asking that the 100 million the Prime Minister has pledged for modernisation uh, should be allocated on the basis of need and certainly not by the Barnett formula. So can I ask the Minister what practical steps he is taking to ensure Northern Ireland's fleet gets its fair share of that £100 million pounds reserve? Well, from 2 to 2.30 I had a meeting with Minister Prentice and her team um, from the United Kingdom Government and uh, we discussed these very issues, um, expressed her disappointment, which she agreed actually with. Uh, in terms of the actual outcome, and uh, we raised the issue of the 100 million. Uh, we also raised the issue of uh, the amount of uh, fish that, that we catch outside of the RIC, and considerable amount of um, the traditional catch is outside of the RIC box, and that needs to be taken into account when the UK quota is being distributed. Northern Ireland have uh, been taking around 8.4 per cent um, of uh, the. UK fish catch uh, traditionally. I, I am uh, pressing for that to continue to be the case in the allocation of quota and also in the allocation of the 100 million, as the member rightly points out, should not be associated with Barnet. And as I rightly pointed out uh, to Minister Prentice, um, the need in Northern Ireland would be slightly different from the need in Shropshire. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, uh, last can call you. And uh, whilst the internecine uh, combat between the TUV and the DUP uh, uh, is very interesting and whilst it was uh, exceedingly ironic to hear Paul Given, who, who has just left, uh, accusing others of pursuing decisions on the dogma of political ideology, uh, I mean Brexit is a serious issue uh, and it was a serious issue when it was being pointed out to the DUP by businesses, traders uh, and political parties within this chamber over the last please? number of years. Yep. Uh, 
I uh, am wanting to ask the Minister, does he agree with me that uh, weak labour protections uh, within the trade and cooperation agreement could negatively impact on those involved in the fishing industry moving forward? Well, a key aspect of, of, of fishing is that uh, we provide the skippers and, and others actually uh, man the boats. And a lot of those folks can come from other parts um, of Europe and indeed other parts of the world. Uh, having a, it recognised as um, a skilled uh, trade it was something which was critically important. Uh, so we would have welcomed uh, the, the, the views of MAC, uh, but it's important that the Home Office actually uh, fully accept um, the views expressed by MAC, uh, which will allow us to bring in um, high-quality uh, f- f- fishermen. Uh, many of them will probably be from the Philippines, some from Ghana, uh, but there is a, a, a really good pool of people out there who have a particular expertise, because you cannot put any, um, any labourer onto a boat. It is a very specialised piece of work, and uh, it is something that we need to understand uh, that if we are to, to, to harvest the seas and to be able to, to uh, do that in a, in a sustainable way, um, we will need people from other countries to assist us uh, in doing that. Call Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I won't spend too much breath um, deflecting DUP claims about Brexit because no one really believes them. But in the interests of uh, being constructive, can I ask in relation to fish? In Scotland, we have langoustines rotting in Scottish fish warehouses because they can't get to market on the continent quickly enough. That's not a result of the protocol, that's a result of Brexit. Northern Ireland is in a different position because we have uh, a different kind of unfettered access to the EU market, uh, which should mean that fishermen and fish producers here are at an advantageous position vis-à-vis uh, the rest of the European market, unlike those in and Scotland. Can the come this question? Would the Minister uh, confirm that he's had conversations about maximising those opportunities, and would he offer some thoughts on how to uh, boost those supply chains directly from Northern Ireland to the continent? Well, I think the, the, the problem that the, the Scots have is getting it over um, the Dover Calais Strait and, and down from Peterhead uh, to there in a reasonable time. Um, you shouldn't be letting langoustines rot because most people will actually freeze them, and uh, that's, 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 that's something which, which normally happens. Uh, but in any event, we have full access to the single market, uh, and we will seek to utilise that. One of the problems that we had previously, though, is that around £5 million worth of fish um, from Scotland actually uh, was brought here for processing uh, to, be, to, be, to be sold. And that will have a significant impact if we can no longer import those fish um, for further sale. Um, so, uh, again, uh, the internal market issue, um, the issue of over 50% of our trade, both from Northern Ireland to GB and over 50% of our imports coming from GB, um, those who, who advocated um, putting barriers in that market um, were advocating foolishness of the highest order. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I um, don't need to waste my time talking about the fact that I voted against Brexit and again, we voted against the protocol. But as the Minister has already outlined, um, Northern Ireland boats are excluded from all but two ports in the south. Um, as someone who lives extremely close to Port of Vogue, I'd be very keen to find out what you're doing and what conversations you're having with the UK Government and the Irish Government to um, sort out this outstanding issue. That issue was also discussed with Minister Prentice today. Um, further to that, we have written uh, to the Irish Government. We have requested meetings with the Irish Government. Um, I'm waiting for uh, Minister McConnell uh, to facilitate that meeting. I'd hope it will be sooner rather than later. I'd hoped that it would be last week. Um, but I am, I am in their hands. I've requested the meeting. I can't force, uh, force the meeting. Moving on, I call Sean Lynch. About three, question three. The question is more appropriate for the Minister of Finance to answer. However, I am aware that as part of the spending review announced on the 25th of November 2020, the UK Government launched a new levelling up fund worth £4 billion for England. It will also attract up to £0.8 billion for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Funding to the Northern Ireland Executive will be in line with the Barnett formula and based upon allocations to Whitehall departments, and that will follow a competitive process. The timing and quantum of these allocations remain uncertain. And as with all allocations under the Barnett formula, this funding will be unhypothecated, meaning it will be for the executive to determine how it is spent in Northern Ireland. 
the Minister of Finance should be able to provide an update on this fund whenever there is more clarity from the Treasury. I, call Sean Lynch. I thank the Minister for answering the question. Can the Minister clarify if the levelling up fund will specifically focus on rural areas as defined in the Rural Needs Act? I am not in a position to do that yet. Um, the, actually, the Finance Minister did give some thoughts on it this morning. Uh, he thought it was uh, more something to level up between uh, the south and the north of England, and that is what uh, its main aim is. However, um, if we do get our share um, through the Barnett formula, um, it will be for the executive to ultimately decide how it is spent. I, I would welcome any support that I can get from Sinn Féin members with the Finance Minister to direct that towards rural communities through DERA. I think that would be an excellent suggestion. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Question number four, Mr Deputy Speaker. Air quality is monitored within the East Belfast constituency at an automatic monitoring station at Ballyhackamore in the Upper Newton Arts Road. The pollutant that is monitored at this stage is nitrogen dioxide. Additional nitrogen dioxide monitoring, known as passive sampling, is carried out at roadside locations using diffusion tubes. Diffusion tubes are located at a number of locations across East Belfast. There is also a diffusion tube co-location study with three diffusion tubes located in close proximity to Ballyhackamore automatic site. These two methods of monitoring complement each other and strengthen the data gathered. Passive sampling using diffusion tubes takes place at a further seven locations across the East Belfast constituency. These locations are North Road, Short Strand, Knock Road, Station Road, Upper Newton Ards and Hollywood Road, Titanic Quarter and Upper Knock Breeder Road. Historic data for the Halley Hackamore site and all other monitoring stations in the network are available online through the, my department's Northern Ireland Air website. I would like to encourage everyone to visit this site where you can download the new Northern Ireland Air app, see the locations of all the monitoring stations and receive the most up-to-date information on the quality of air across Northern Ireland. I call Robin Newton for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, detailed answer. The Minister will be aware that uh, in London recently, um, a nine-year-old girl um, uh, was, uh, when the coroner ruled on her death, he ruled that it was air pollution made a material contribution to her, her death. Uh, can I ask the Minister, why is it that in Northern Ireland we only monitor the one pollutant rather than the variety of pollutants? Yeah, that was a very interesting case. And Belfast, whilst it is nowhere near the levels of, of um, perhaps vehicles and so forth that, that, that London has to absorb and uh, the, the numbers, uh, nonetheless, because it lies within a series of hills, uh, sometimes, uh, very often in fact, uh, the air does not change particularly quickly, and therefore um, you know, the pollutants that, that are there uh, tend to stay in the atmosphere. Um, the reason, in terms of the, the nitrogen dioxide, it, it was a pollutant that was particularly uh, identified as part of a review and assessment process that took place in conjunction um, with the City Council, uh, which was completed um, in early 2004. And that assessment concluded that modelled and monitored exceedances of short and long term objectives for both nitrogen dioxide and particular matter were occurring in the city and would be likely to continue to do so in locations beyond 2010. So, as a consequence of the initial review and assessment process, Belfast City Council commenced an extensive monitoring programme of nitrogen dioxide because it was the main pollutant of concern in Belfast and, in particular, the east of the city. I call John Blair. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for the answer in relation to this topic. C can I ask further to the answers given if the Minister can make a commitment that the Clean Air Strategy will be published and implemented this year? Oh, certainly. Once I have considered the options and decided in policy direction, officials should begin to draft the first Clean Air Strategy for Northern Ireland. Uh, and this will be a more focused and shorter document than the discussion document, which is currently out and will contain specific proposals relating to policy and other measures which can improve air quality. And this draft clean air strategy will be subject to uh, an additional public consultation um, due to its cross-cutting nature in the policy area. 
Um, so we'll also be seeking the executive approval and trust that that will be forthcoming. I call Matthew to. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, last year a report from Centre uh, for Cities said that Belfast was the second highest emitter per head of particulate matter of cities in the UK. We've got a wonderful city, we've got a great future, but one of the things that people want desperately is to live in a clean city where their kids breathe clean air. Can I ask the Minister that when he publishes the clean air strategy, that making Belfast a cleaner, greener city to live in and improving our air quality should be right at the heart of that clean air strategy? Well, certainly the issues around air quality are greater in Belfast, followed by Lumpenderry, which stands to sense. Um, than any other part of, of Northern Ireland. Um, and therefore, a lot of, of the work that we will do um, in tackling the issue of air quality uh, will be related to the city of Belfast. Moving on, I call Pat Sheehan. Or my good case to Coog, uh, question five, please. The eradication of BTB uh, remains one of my top priorities. I'm well aware of the devastating emotional and financial impact that TB breakdown can have on farming families across Northern Ireland when disease is found in their herds. So we do intend to move forward with the strategy as soon as possible, though some of the strategy recommendations subject to my final approval will likely require changes to existing legislation and further consultation. Officials are working at pace to finalise the strategy and the accompanying business case, and once this work has been completed, I will then be in a position to make a final and informed decision on the elements of a BTB eradication strategy, which will ensure a holistic approach and address all of the key factors and the maintenance and spread of the disease here in Northern Ireland. Call Pat Sheen for supplementary. Thank the Minister for that answer. And I wonder, uh, could he indicate to us what new measures he hopes will be in the, uh, the bovine TB strategy? Well, there will be a series of things, both from farm, far, farming and, and farming practice, and there already has been considerable steps taken um, on that front. Um, right through to as to how we can deal with the issue uh, of other spreaders um, to the animal population. Uh, so there will be a responsibility placed upon uh, all uh, to ensure that we continue to drive uh, this disease downwards uh, in the bovine population and ensure that we have a healthier bovine and indeed wildlife po population whenever this is concluded. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, in the event that a farm has been closed with TB, can I ask, you're aware that within calves that are under six weeks, there's a very small incidence of TB in those calves. Is it not possible that a farmer could get calves under six weeks old, TB tested, sell them online or directly to another farmer, therefore not going through a March system? Well, th that, that would be a matter um, which the veterinary service will have to give advice on. Uh, in terms of it, uh, I would say our, our effort at this moment in time is to drive down the spread of TB. Uh, I know that um, TB can be latent in animals, so animals that, that um, move can, can uh, not show any signs whatsoever, and at a later point uh, show signs of TB. Uh, so, it's one of those, those difficult ones. We are looking quite seriously, and, and it's already happening in England, about moving animals from one closed herd to another um, closed herd, uh, and those would be beef finishing units, uh, and you know the possibility of people who specialise in calf rearing through the beef, um, taking that on. Uh, so that is something that we are looking at. Kelly Armstrong for a brief question. Thank you very much, um, Minister. Just very quickly, then, I um, appreciate the time. I'm asking what consultation is taking place with the wildlife and conservation sector, and um, just if you can clarify those badgers that are killed along the side of the road, if that service is still carrying on through COVID? Yeah, we've had engagement with the Wildlife, um, Ulster Wildlife Trust, and, and others um, on this issue. Um, the, the piece of work that, that where badgers are sampled at the side of the road still continues. And uh, there's a very high proportion of those um, are found to have to be carriers of, of, of TB. <clears throat> and that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. I can I advise members that question number four has been withdrawn? And I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I note the, the Minister has repeated his warning about the security of the uh, food supply chain, but he previously posted this on social media, and I quote, 
Cringeworthy comments from CBI Northern Ireland that there would be no food on our shelves. The bulk of the food on the shelves is produced within the UK, embarrassing themselves and scaring people who don't know the facts. Two contradictory statements, Deputy Speaker. Would the real Edwin Poots please stand up? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's uh, obviously been identified by someone who didn't actually pay much attention uh, to what the first tweet was about. The first tweet was about um, food coming from the European Union. And were the member uh, to understand the subject well enough, he would realise that the European Union accounts for around, the rest, the rest, of, the, the rest of the EU, as it's described, accounts for around 10% of the food imports to Northern Ireland, where the food from GB accounts for over 50% of the food that comes to Northern Ireland. So the first tweet was about the 10%. The issue that we're facing today is about the 50%. So some idiot uh, decides to conflate two issues, uh, which are two separate issues, and then claim them to be of some great importance. Um, and I'm sorry that the member has, has built uh, his question today on the, uh, on the work of an idiot. Colin McNesbitt for supplement. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, the issue does seem to be the protocol, and as the First Minister told this House last month, uh, the protocol was opposed, imposed upon us uh, and negotiated uh, by the UK Government. Uh, and again, the Minister for Agriculture previously told this House, and it's in Hansard, and I quote, uh, I'm proud to be part of the United Kingdom and to put my faith in our national government. Are you still proud to put your faith in the national government? Well, I'm not sure about the member, but I'm still proud to be part of the United Kingdom, and uh, I will work uh, very closely uh, with everyone who I can uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland gets the best deal possible at all times. I'd have to say that the, the, the deal that was negotiated um, is not the deal that I have negotiated. It's not the deal that many people in Northern Ireland <coughs> wanted, and the consequences of it is that um, there isn't um, so much a cultural barrier. Um, it doesn't impact upon us in terms of our standing within the United Kingdom on so many fronts, but it does create a trade barrier, and that trade barrier causes problems um, to both um, food processors, uh, to food retailers, and to consumers as a consequence of it. And I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, could you give us a, an update on the Ammonia Action Plan? The Ammonia Action Plan is something that um, we have had considerable work uh, in looking at, and uh, we are hopeful that we can make a real difference uh, in terms of um, dealing with the issue of ammonia. Uh, it, it is high in Northern Ireland, given uh, the fact that we have high livestock numbers um, for the, the, the square miles that exist in Northern Ireland. That's not something. Uh, that is bad because it creates employment for around 100,000 people and brings £5 billion into the local economy. Uh, however, uh, we do need to address this issue, and as a result of work that we are doing, uh, we believe that we can considerably reduce the amount of ammonia going into the atmosphere um, over a relatively short period of time. Uh, certainly, the first 20 per cent. Um, is something that we believe that we can uh, make a, a, a real dent in quite quickly. Uh, some of the challenges beyond that uh, will be greater and will involve more significant investment. I have raised the issue of investment um, with the Finance Minister and indeed the Executive uh, in relation to meeting our new decade, new approach commitments um, on the environment um, and also uh, the issues arising out of ammonia. I call Stuart Dixon for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for, you, for your answer so far. In that action plan, Minister, will you address or will the action plan address the issues of uh, bioaerosols, which are released uh, particularly from pig rearing and its associated activities? Uh, uh, indeed, a great source of nuisance uh, to many residents in uh, residential areas, not least of all in my constituency in the Monkstown area. One of the the best means of actually addressing those issues is, is actually the housing uh, that uh, animals um, have. And I would have to say that there has been tremendous progress made um, on housing and on reduction of ammonia um, coming from, from housing. So the, the more modern 
um, pig root units um, are considerably better than the existing ones. So it's with some alarm um, whenever I see planning permission refused um, for replacement pig farms, in spite of the fact that they had recognised that there would be a, a significant reduction uh, in ammonia uh, by the construction of the new development um, over the one that currently existed. I call it Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that the need for a pet passport between Northern Ireland and the UK is unnecessary and was part of the Northern Ireland Protocol supported by the Green Party, Sinn Féin, the SDLP, and indeed voted for at Westminster by the Alliance Party? Yeah, thank, thank the member for the question. In terms of pet travel, um, this is a vexed issue. Um, it really just shouldn't be the case that, that this is happening. Uh, I consider it a, a, a cruel um, to actually have to put pets through uh, the administration um, of unnecessary medication. So, you know, forcing pet owners uh, to get a rabies vaccination um, on a pet and indeed the tapeworm uh, administration, whenever neither tapeworm nor rabies exists on the British Isles, is something which shouldn't be happening. And we have a common travel area uh, for the people of the British Isles. And in my opinion, the European Union should recognise that common travel area that exists uh, for human beings and have the same uh, for pets. It has a particularly negative impact um, on the issue of guide dogs. And as a consequence of that, we will have less uh, people who are um, blind or partially sighted able to access guide dogs as a result of this protocol, and that is cruel. I call Alex Eason for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister give a reassurance that his department will continue to look at all avenues to try and resolve this issue that has been imposed on our pet owners? I indicated the meetings that had taken place earlier, um, and we are in regular contact uh, with Michael Gove, um, Branton Lewis, uh, George Eustace on a range of issues. And I can assure him that the issue on pet travel has been brought up on a regular basis. And everybody recognises the madness of it. But we need people who have the authority to, to, to actually deal with the madness of it, not just recognise it. Moving on, I call Karen McKillen. Um, can the Minister detail what his department is doing to eradicate harmful, harmful pesticides? Uh, particularly on our food uh, and flowers here? Well, in terms of pesticides, um, this is actually governed by the European Union and we will still be under the regulations um, of the European Union. Uh, so there is a, a, a committee that, that, that deals with these issues and uh, it's made up of, of, of a range of experts who will give advice on it. Uh, and we in Northern Ireland seek to comply uh, with the regulations that come on that. I call Karen Killen for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his response. Um, could he also provide assurance um, to do everything he can to protect our Indigenous bee population, which is so crucial and critical to our ecology and our, indeed our environment? Well, one of the issues for, for bees and she, uh, the, the the member is quite right, he said minister there, but the member is quite right to, to raise the, the issue of, of bees, um, is pollination. And we can, you know, obviously the issue of pesticides is one, one element of it, but also creating areas uh, for pollination is, is very important. And uh, we will work closely with, particularly with people um, who are landowners and farmers, um, to actually develop areas off land. Um, which will uh, allow for greater levels of pollination to take place. Um, so key pollinators such as um, fruit trees and wildflowers and things like that there, um, as, as we're looking at, at new ways of, of uh, dispersing single farm payment and all of that there, um, these are areas which we'll seek to encourage. I call George Robinson. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister is there a timeline from the department for the resolution of any problems being experienced by supermarkets with imp importing goods? Well, the, the problems for supermarkets haven't, ha haven't had full effect yet uh, because the problems kick in on the 1st of April. And what the supermarkets have indicated to us is that it is critically important that they do not face a cliff edge at the 31st of March. 
So we already had a cliff edge on the 31st of December. Um, but it will be much more significant on the 31st of March um, if uh, there is not change to the current uh, proposals that exist. And the consequences of us not having that change, I outlined last week uh, to some extent. Um, there is a further problem come six months, uh, whenever the, the chilled and processed foods um, kick in, uh, and, and the issues that will pertain to that. Uh, both of those things will lead to a loss of trade in Northern Ireland and a loss of service and supply in Northern Ireland and will lead to a far greater proportion of empty shelves should nothing be done uh, than is currently the case. I call George Robinson. Thank the Minister <coughs> for his answer. Would the Minister agree that the Prime Minister, Westminster Government, the EU are entirely to blame for any delays by agreeing to a deal that did not impact the mainland, but its implications for the whole of Northern Ireland? Yes, uh, I, I think that the, the deal that was negotiated was not a good deal for Northern Ireland, uh, and therefore uh, those people who look for the rigorous implementation of it are looking for a bad circumstance for the people of Northern Ireland, because the consequence of the rigorous implementation of this is that we do nothing in terms of supermarket trade. And we do nothing in terms of the chilled and processed foods that are coming in. And the consequence of that will be that there will be numerous items which will no longer be available on the shelves of Northern Ireland. You know, I, I, I noted someone, someone saying that we have enough food to feed 10 million people. We do. And that is beef, chicken, lamb, uh, potatoes, you know, a whole series of, of foods that we are very good at producing. But Hartleys and Heinz and Roundtree and, and a vast range of these large processing organisations um, don't actually operate in Northern Ireland. So you can have your roast beef dinner, but you mightn't have any bisto on it. Um, and there's so many other things uh, that you mightn't have, have a nice bit of trifle after it uh, either, uh, George, uh, well, because you don't have any jelly. Um, there are so many things which we don't have and which are, are, are manufactured in Great Britain. We don't need these barriers. We really don't need these barriers, and we need common sense, uh, particularly from the European Union. And that's why I've written to the European Union Vice President, because, and we need a message going out from all of our colleagues here that we do not need barriers, um, which is going to put costs on our food coming from our main, ma main source of it in Great Britain uh, to Northern Ireland. I call Emma Rogan, and she'll be unlikely to have a supplement. Can the Minister tell us what um, measures the Department is putting in place to address issues um, of the so-called blue algae, um, which is present, for example, on the lake in Castle Well in my own constituency? That's a tricky one, and I'm not sure um, what measures we, we can take to overcome that. Um, I haven't got it in these notes, um, but I did uh, have a previous note about the blue algae in Castle Well Lake, and it is a very, very a challenging issue to overcome, and uh, I know that officials are, are looking at it and have been working, um, you know, with, with, with people who, who have considerable knowledge in these issues uh, to actually tackle uh, the issue that the member has raised. And that is the end of our period of time of questions. The Minister for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before the urgent oral question.